I'm George Siegel, and this is the Move the World podcast. Every week, we feature interviews with people dedicated to making the world a better place. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's Move the World podcast, where um, every week we try to introduce you to somebody who's doing something in their job or in their life to move the world. And my guest today is certainly doing something that is, is or should be very important to all of us. Sandy Sturm is the founder of Earth Focus Group and environmentalgroups.us. She and her husband live full-time in their RV and travel the U.S. documenting the effects of climate change in communities just like yours. Sandy, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, climate change is something that, you know, we hear about all the time. I recently made a documentary film. I think I told you a little bit about that, where it's called The Last House Standing. And we talked to experts in there that talk about all the problems that are happening around mm-hmm. the country. And these experts say climate change is real. We need to do something about it. And mm-hmm. you are someone, before we talk about the book that you wrote, climate and being outdoors and everything has been a big part of your whole life. Tell us about, uh, tell us about that background growing up. Oh, it's yes. Um, well, in the book, I told stories about when I was young, I grew up in St. Louis area. So I was introduced to um, my outdoor life at the grandparents cabin in the Ozarks. So, you know, we caught tadpoles and um, had a lot of fish fries. <laughs> but uh, I think that's that's where I I first remember that experience. But since then, I've just been a wanderer. You know, as as early as I can remember, even 13, I wanted to just escape. (laughs) So uh, now our lifestyle, you know, satisfies that. I've got a national park habit. Um, I think we've been to 42 of them so far. Kind of slowed down the last year and a half. But um, yeah, we just like to be out. And that's, that's why we live in this RV. So we can, it's got wheels. We can go when we want. Okay. So Sandy, if I asked you, you know, before we, again, we're going to get into talking about this book, what would you say you do or your mission is to help move the world? Well, the Earth Focus Group does have a, a, our vision is, you know, we see a world of people who understand that are changing, you know, they understand that the climate is changing and that our individual actions affect every person on earth. You know, it's just like the butterfly effect whatever we do here affects someone across the other side of the world. Um, So that's kind of drive. Does it kind of drive you nuts when people say it's just cyclical? The world is, you know, we've always had extremes from one thing to the other. Um, What's your reaction when you hear that kind of uh, counter argument to climate change? Well, it's true, but they're missing some apart (laughs) that, you know, there's data uh, that spans 800,000 years, you know, um, through ice core samples. And I think people may have heard of ice core samples where they can measure this, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And it did. So every 25,000 years or so, it would go like this. You know, we'd have an ice age and go down and go up and down. But then we hit the mid 20th century and it shot straight up. So that's not cyclical anymore. <laughs> That is, it's, you know, the parts plus in my lifetime, if you think about it logically, I was, when I was born, there was less than 3 billion people on the planet. Now there's over 7 billion. So all those people need resources to live and they're burning, you know, when you uh, adding carbon to the atmosphere. So if you think of it just logically that way, we can't keep adding carbon because it's warming up the planet so it's not a it's not the typical cyclical now it's just sh- shot straight up they call that uh the hockey stick <laughs> you know because that's what it looks like on the chart but so they do have data for eight hundred thousand years well one of the things we talked about in uh, the last house standing film is whether or not you want to trench in and say you, if you're a climate change denier whatever argument you want to take the fact is, if you're a homeowner, if you live someplace, the effects of weather are getting more dramatic in a lot of places. And we're seeing a lot more damage. We're seeing a lot more fires out west. We're seeing more extreme storms in the spring, stronger hurricanes. So doing something seems like a good idea. Right. I'm sure you, you're on board with that 100%. Right. 
it's it's going to take you know they uh some people say it's it's going to take major policy only but i see it as everyone's an individual and i can actually share a story about that how um you know we rely on our local policy makers um for example to turn uh be 100% renewable energy in your community. That would take a vote of the of the council, right? Your city council or aldermen's, whatever you have. But those people are individuals. Um, back, way back, <laughs> I was in uh, recycling and waste management and I had to go, uh, we did dumpster dives with kids at the high school to see how much of the waste was actually recyclable or compostable. And then we went, um, I gave them a tour of the landfill. We did a tour of the recycling center. And not long after that, I had to go before the city council to approve, uh, I don't know what, we were building a, a household hazardous waste collection or something. But the woman on the council that I was most worried about stood up and said she was mad at me. <laughs> I said, oh, great. <laughs> but it was because her son was part of that group that went dumpster diving into the landfill and her son made them start recycling at home. <laughs> so see, it's, <laughs> we're all in, they're all individuals. So we have to make those, you know, if the individual can make changes, then it can affect policy and everything else. Right. Yeah, unfortunately, any, <laughs> anything that relies on government or politicians making decisions that trickle down to us that seem to be in our best interest seems to take a long time. And what I loved about your book was there are things people can start doing right now. You don't need anybody to tell you to do them. And the, the book is called Family Survival Guide for Our Changing Climate, 52 Empowering Actions You and Your Family Can Take Now. And there, I went through all of them, and it, it's really interesting that people can start doing something right away to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and right now, I mean, we're heading into a big, you know, buying frenzy, right, for the winter holidays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I, I promote this time of year experiences instead of stuff. A lot of that stuff is sitting out on barges right now. <laughs> So it's not going to be on the shelves. So it's a very good time to start. I mean, pull out that calendar, make a list of who your gifts are for the year. What kind of experience can you give them instead? I know uh, when my parents were alive, they lived in Florida and we lived out in Utah and they would fly in. Now, I know it's a big carbon dump is flying, but <laughs> they would fly into Denver, you know, to come see us. And we bought them train tickets from Denver over to Utah, which is through the Rockies. They loved that experience. And that's what they talked about. They don't remember the little other tchotchkes that I would buy them. Um, so just sharing, you can share experiences uh, with whoever you're giving a gift to or just give them something that they will remember the rest of their life instead of just a thing, right? Yeah, I think that's a more, that's a more thoughtful thing. I mean, even if it's the gift of spending time with them or right. the gift of, of having a nice afternoon out or doing something fun, going to the zoo, doing something other than just going out and buying something that's going to amount to nothing. And, and that seems like, um, it seems like it's easier sometimes to just grab a gift, even though it doesn't mean anything, than to plan the actual experience. And it's more meaningful. They know you, you're really thinking about them. They know that um, you know that they like to go to the the shows. Or plus, you're promoting your local, you know, your local businesses at the same time. <laughs> the, the, yeah, yeah. the museums and the you know that kind of thing. Now, something else that I thought was was interesting in the book, because I hadn't really thought of it, although we do it a lot, is a lot of times when you're going to throw something out, you're suggesting throwing them out isn't necessarily the best idea. And I, I actually followed your book. We had an old power washer that I couldn't get started. Normally, I would have just tossed it. Instead, I put it out by the curb with a sign on it. Another person drove by in a pickup truck and is now probably going to be using that power washer as opposed to throwing it out. So one of your things is about repurposing stuff, isn't it? 
Oh, exactly. There's, there's, there's people that would love to have the stuff that you no longer want. <laughs> so that's always the first step, you know, either donating it to, you know, somewhere like Goodwill or our local um, reuse store. Um, and in my opinion, you know, I used to be big in the recycling world, but recycling is a very last resort. You shouldn't buy something just because you can recycle it. And a lot of the things made today, you can't recycle anyway. So buying quality to begin with, so you're not tossing it. You know, you buy a toaster today, it's not expected to last your lifetime and they won't fix it. <laughs> so yeah. uh, buying quality and then um, donating it. Um, I was thinking... I wrote a little curriculum years ago about the life cycle of a bicycle, you mm -hmm. know, and, and the, the products in that bicycle traveled like 80,000 miles around the world before it got to you. And then it went on to, you can always donate that bicycle when you're too big for it or you no longer want it instead of just tossing it because it took 80,000 miles of energy uh, to build that little bicycle. <laughs> So I'm talking the plastic and the uh, the steel. And you can, if you look at everything through that lens, um, you know, like a computer years ago, I there were stats that, uh, and laptops haven't changed much, but a laptop produced 40 tons of waste when it's made, one laptop. Wow. So you just have to think from, and I might be going too deep here, but exploration and extraction and manufacturing and transportation. So every time I buy something, I think of where it's been and what it took to get there. Um, yeah. And then I think back of there, we used to be two, two billion people. Now there's seven billion people and they're all doing, you know, the same thing. Yep. Now, one of the things also I thought was interesting, you talk about the amount of food that we throw out. And I gave that statistic, I think it was like 30 or 40%. You said we toss out. Um, and I said that to my wife and she goes, no, that's not true. And then we went into the refrigerator and we threw out this, we threw out this, we threw out this that never got eaten because it ends up in Tupperware sitting in the refrigerator. So people are incredible wasters of food. And it's the whole, it's the whole food chain. I mean, there's a lot wasted just at the beginning because we don't want ugly food right? The fruits and vegetables, they won't put that out at the store. So there's a percentage that gets wasted. And then if you think restaurants, they really uh, end up throwing out a lot of food. Um, just think about what's left on the plate and sent back, you know, into the dishwasher. So there, there is a lot. And um, yeah, every, every channel in the food chain is, has waste. So we can take, take control um, I tend to make, I'd make a very detailed list of what I'm going to cook. And that's exactly what I go to the store to get, you know, you gotta, you gotta be strong. <laughs> <laughs> that's easier said than done when you have kids, you know, like they want my kids like this. Uh, they like ramen noodles and Nutella, two things that if you left them out or buried them a hundred years from now, they probably would be in the same condition that they're in right. now. <laughs> Um, because I think that stuff is disgusting, but so you can't win all those battles, but you're right. Planning better, you know, cooking what you're going to eat. And if you are going to have leftovers, make sure you use them and they don't just sit there for a month. Right. Yeah. That's tough to do now. Uh, paper products, paper-free vendors. Um, you're saying like, don't hand out stuff at trade shows. Oh, I like to get a pen at a trade show, but there's a lot of garbage that gets handed out at trade shows, isn't there? I mean, how many of you have, have, have been handed a, a plastic bag when we could go to trade shows yeah. and you fill that bag, you bring it, you know, end up back wherever you started and it sits on the floor there for a while. And then eventually you, know, you just toss it. But <laughs> what my pet peeve is going, you know, if it's like an Earth Day event or one of a rally or something and the nonprofits are there and their whole table's full of paper. You know, it's not necessary <laughs> to, to, you can go send them to the website. They have a website. You could have a big QR code there 
and then some uh, um, you know nice imagery of what your what your mission what you're doing and then talk to people i mean um I think we just got stuck in that rut of handing things out, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's a nonprofits or the business world, you know, the business world. Yeah. They like to hand out all kinds of things <laughs> that are end up in the dumpster eventually. What do you think of the paper straw? I'm not a fan of the paper straw. You know, that's what we used to have. <laughs> <laughs> it's the paper straw. I, I, I know. Just don't, I have you ever tried to have a have, have you ever tried to have a smoothie with a paper straw? You oh get, no, no. It's terrible. <laughs> I mean, I could see why I people think it's important, but it doesn't work in all instances. I've been places where you're going. Really, you're giving me one of these. I mean, that's that's a tough one. I, just, I opt out of the straw together. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably um, that's probably not a, a bad idea. Now, solar power. You talk about that. I actually recently had a guy out here to talk about solar power with us, and it really, I know it's not for everybody because it can be a big to do to 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 get it. You're, you're paying for it over a long period of time, and they really don't tell you other than the fact you're doing something good, what the value that of that is that it brings to your house. So would you say you're doing that because it's more of doing something good or, or it's actually going to save you money? Oh, both. It can save you money and it does increase the value of your home. It depends where you're living, you know, um, because when you sell that home, you're selling that solar system and whoever's buying your home, they don't have a payment. So they don't have an electric bill, basically, when they buy your home. So you're adding value there. Um, but it, you know, it's getting, it's getting more affordable to get the batteries. And I think that's a big part as we, as we learn to adapt to these weather changes is to have a battery pack, uh, attached to your solar. If you survive the storm, um, at least you'll have electricity, <laughs> you know, yeah, the salesman I spoke with, they didn't really even go down that road because they said that added a tremendous amount of expense to the, the project. I mean, this one guy said it's $50,000. And I said, okay, so if, if I put a pool in, I know what that value will be to my house. It's not going to be the dollar for dollar. It's going to be a smaller percentage of it. And he had no way of translating that to solar power. So I, I guess over time, they'll get better at selling it. Um, he should know. Yeah, he should have known that. Or they you would think. <laughs> so, some interesting things on there that I, that I did like. Uh, the community tool shed. Talk about that. Yeah, like you said, with your power washer. I mean, you know, and I think of my my brother's garage as <laughs> you can't even hardly walk in there. Uh, it's got so many, many tools and things. So why not if you're in a community and he is, um, you know, that has an HOA, maybe have a community tool shed where you share things like power washers or, or big uh, weed whacker deals, um, depending on what what uh, region you live in, snow, snow blowers or you know, um, just things, you know, there's no reason everyone should have something they only use three times a year, you know, yeah. oh, that's, that, and the, the, yeah. <laughs> now one so, of them was bring, bring back the picnic basket. People probably yeah. rather than have plastic bags or to go bags from a grocery store actually have a picnic basket. Right. Yeah. And then there's another experience you can have, you know, in the evening, grab the kids, go down by the Creek and have a picnic you know, instead mm -hmm. of eating out. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, you had green hotels. I know there's a lot of hotels that leave notes there saying they'll, they don't do the towels every day if you keep using them. I mean, how do you identify what a, a green hotel is and, and, and do business with them? Well, the, I believe the book has a link. Um, there's, there's an association that they belong to and they have to meet certain criteria. And I think a green motel goes way beyond not washing your towels every day. I mean, it's, it's built, it, it would have um, maybe passive solar, um, you know, to warm the lobby, for example, or um, the materials they, they use to build the, the, uh, the building are very energy efficient. Um, the lighting is all LED lighting. Um, they, they just follow conservation measures. They don't let the sprinklers run 24-7 or, 
uh, water the sidewalks, you know, things like that. So there are standards um, that they need to follow. And there is a list and they'll have, I've been in buildings, even convention centers, there's a plaque on the wall. Um, I'm trying to think of the, I can't remember the, the entity that actually gives that certification, but um, it should be duly noted on the building too. Yeah, it's tough to get people to switch their habits, but I think that's part of part of a lifestyle is then actually supporting businesses that support what you believe in. And, and we encourage that with the last house standing in, in terms of builders. If a builder is building a house that is built with the right materials and has a good chance of surviving the disasters that are in that area, those builders should be rewarded over the person who's just putting up a, a stick house that is uh, just a lightning rod for problems. But people choose to take the easier path, it seems, most of the time, and they live in what they want as opposed to what probably is the right thing to live in. Do you find that with the same thing with getting people to um, believe in, in, in doing all these things? Yeah, we get, well, we're all very busy and to learn something new. And that's why I did it this way, just little baby steps. I mean, because we're inundated with so much information. So... Yeah, a builder has done that for the, the whole 50 years. So I'm going to continue doing it that way sort of thing. They have their supply yeah. chains already. They, you know, so you need, it, it would take a bit of education. They'd have to learn, um, you know, how to do it the new ways, but the technology's there. And, and hopefully the next generation of builders will conform to that if, and it doesn't have to come down to policy, you know. True. Make I, <laughs> yeah, the building codes are definitely not strong enough in, in, in most areas. And that's why in our film, we told people you have to be your own best advocate and demand more for yourself. Because if you're waiting for somebody to do that, that could take 10, 20 years or whatever. And you could be wiped out by a disaster before then. So you really have to be proactive. Right. Now, the LED light bulb thing, I, I've started doing that um, because I got tired of replacing bulbs. One bulb in my house went out four times. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go get LEDs. And if you shop around, you can get them at a really good price now. That, mm -hmm. that price cost has come way down. And okay. that can make a huge difference in the long run, can it? Oh, it sure can. Um, you know, an easy test on that. Lights, lights put off energy and heat. So if you remember the, the incandescent light bulb, you would never touch that, right, when it's mm -hmm. on. But an LED, it could be on for hours, and you could still unscrew that light bulb by hand. So it doesn't release all that the heat-wasted energy. So that, I mean, if you wanted to think of it, um, why it's better. <laughs> I mean, there's numbers. Um, it doesn't, so it doesn't emit a, as much CO2 in the atmosphere because it's using less energy, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's less energy draw from the power plant. So now I was not aware of this at all in the book. You talk about unplugging appliances, not just turning them off. So a plugged in appliance, like a toaster or a coffee machine is still drawing power. It is. And it doesn't have to have a little red light on it, you know? Um, I, I woke up one morning and saw all these red lights around and, and I got, <laughs> I got curious. So I took a picture. All, I think I had 12 little red lights all over my RV, but they don't have to have that red light to be drawn, you know, cause that's, you know, you know, it's drawn power for that, but I guess the circuit is continually trying to connect whether the appliance is on or not. So and okay, it's hard, but I've got these, you know, big uh, power strips. You just turn off the power strip. Yeah, that's but my problem with that is I always end up turning off something that I have to reset. Oh, so, well, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't don't plug the, uh, the oxygen machine. No, don't plug the um, uh, the clock into something like that, because that could that could be a problem for you. Or the microwave you talk, is a pain to. <laughs> yeah, it is resetting that clock every time. Because sometimes they're not as simple as just putting the time in. You have to pick AM, PM and do all that other stuff. And um, who has that kind of time, mm -hmm. right? So um, you also talk about repurposing furniture. A lot of times, I, I know we had a bedroom set that we were just sick of. But instead of trashing it, we painted it. We had some, well, we had somebody come in and paint it. But it looks like a completely different room now. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to repurpose stuff. 
which is probably an argument for buying better stuff or more unique stuff, then, you know, we won't throw a name out like Ikea, but, you know, to, to buy something that might actually last. Right. And you can find a lot of that at secondhand stores, mm -hmm. you know, things that you could, if you've got the time and, and ability, yeah, like paint it or, yeah, make it your own. <laughs> now, one of your, uh, one of the things in the book was that what is the deal with palm oil? Mm. Um, palm oil, I, I, from what I've read, we don't want it in our food, but it's starting to pop up in a lot of foods. Oh, it's everywhere. Um, <laughs> especially for gluten-free foods, a lot of gluten-free foods, cause I'm gluten-free. Um, <clears throat> the ingredient that they put in there to preserve it or do something to it is palm oil. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, but, but how they make it is bad for the environment, isn't it? That causes a whole bunch of other problems. Right. And that Nutella is a big one. <laughs> it's your kids run. But yeah, because they're, they're, um, they're sustainable farms. So you need to find that designation on the label, but, um, palm oil is grown in the tropics. So they're cutting down the, the tropical rainforest to build the plantations. And it is, it's in everything from, you know, your hair care, facial, anything in the bathroom, all, you know, it's not only the kitchen. So it's, it takes an eye. I think one thing that we can do is just read the labels and know what things are, are, are harming the environment and you. <laughs> um, so yeah, palm oil is, is and pineapple. I just wrote an article on pineapple plantations in Costa Rica and how that's causing havoc to the, the entire region. So, um, you know, buying that $2 pineapple from Costa Rica has really got a higher cost than that. So, I mean, you can dig deep into many foods, uh, tropical foods mainly. Yeah, I, I wonder why we use palm oil like we do. Um... And the other one is carrageenan. I didn't see that necessarily in the book, but um, I've just read how that's a, a carcinogen and it's in deli meat. It's in ice cream. I think it's like the third ingredient in Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Oh, I know. It's like, yeah, because it's, it's, it's cheap. That's why. <laughs> it's well, cheap also when, you. yeah, when you're reading <laughs> ingredients on things, if you're reading too long, that means there's too many things in there, right? You don't want a long list of ingredients in your food. You really want something with just a few things in it. Right. That you can pronounce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I used, I used to buy these rotisserie chickens, um, from HEB in Texas and there was 40 ingredients on there. And I said to the guy, one, I asked the, the food, uh, the head of the food, uh, plant or uh, meat, meat department. Mm -hmm. I said, why do you put so much stuff in it? Why can't you just put salt and pepper and, and chicken. So I went back like a month later and they had cut out those 40 ingredients, but instead it said, and other ingredients. And it was the same 40 things. They just shortened the label. <laughs> so it was chicken, salt, pepper, and other ingredients. You really, you can make these things with, without all that stuff. Right. Unfortunately. Well, that, uh... yeah. Preservatives. A lot of it's preservatives. <laughs> Yeah. And so whatever they fed the chicken, I don't know if they have to account for that. But. So what do you tell people when they look at your 52 items and they're feeling like there's nothing they can do that's going to empower them to really make a difference? How do you change that philosophy? Because since I've read it, I've actually been more conscious of these things as I'm going along. Even one of the last ones about drive, just park already instead of driving around, circling, looking for the perfect spot. There's so many mm -hmm. little things we can do on a daily basis to make a difference. That's right. Well, you have to meet them where they're at. You know, um, you can't, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, dictator. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm giving you ways and mainly I'm, I'm meeting people, people that are going to get this book, uh, know they need to make a change. They just don't know how. So this gives them 52 ways that they can, they can start. And then once they, they get involved and um, start, if they want to do more research, you know, and like you, you've tried a couple of things, even a change in light bulbs is a big deal, you know, so, uh, or, or go test drive an electric car because they're fun to drive. And maybe when you buy a new car in 10 years, you'll buy an electric car. Um, I'm not saying go trash, you know, throw out what you've got. <laughs> um but as we 
get new appliances um, as we move into a new home um, because, you know, we move, people move about. Um, maybe your new job. So maybe you, you've got enough uh, uh, knowledge to know or make suggestions, even at work, you know, let's not use a lot of paper cups and plates for our meetings and buy junk food, you know, things like that. So every, yeah, every little bit helps. Yeah. Even stuff as simple as party decorations, party favors. I mean, you list all this stuff that most people probably don't think about on a regular basis, but it's a good feeling if you can eliminate those because at least you're trying to do something. Well, that, you know, and you, you have a, I, I call it the, the party tubs, you know, just have a tub of all these things that you can reuse at your gatherings. Then you don't have to go out and buy things either, <laughs> you know, so it saves money and uh, it's more reusable things. So yeah. for people that are sitting out there with an idea or a thought and they want to do something to move the world, but they're, they're just not going anywhere with it, what advice would you have them have, give them so they could step up and maybe do something that could make a difference? Um, well, just get the book. Oh, <laughs> if it's climate <That's>, change. <laughs> there you go. And then lead by example. You know, just like raising kids, you have to lead by example. So if you think you need to make some changes at home, just do it. Don't make a big deal out of it. So this is the way my parents did it. This is the way I'm going to do it, right? That's that's a common common thing. So, um, and then every every uh, action we take and every purchase we make has a carbon footprint. So let's be conscious of that. Um, and and jumping into the holiday season, let's think of experiences instead of stuff. And that's an easy one to start with, <laughs> you know. So where can people change. get where can people get the book? Well, it's on Amazon um, and I can give you a link. I have another, um, I have a promotion that uh, I bought a bunch of books. So I'm uh, just for the cost of, of shipping and handling, I'll send you one. Okay. We'll put that in the show notes so people can, can click on that. Um, but I would say definitely they should grab this book and, and look it over and, and start chipping away at these things because you know, I don't think of myself as an environmentally conscious guy on a day to day basis. But when I thought of, hey, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I actually, am, I do a lot of these things on this list, or I'm starting to. So it, I think it can really resonate with people. Right. Yeah, and I'd love to hear about what people are doing. I mean, this is only 52. There's a lot more. And we like to share, um, you know, happy, happy stories, success stories. We get enough of the gloom and doom, right? <laughs> Absolutely. On a daily basis. Hey, yeah. Sandy, thank you so much uh, for coming on. I appreciate your time and I, I appreciate you sharing the book. I appreciate it too. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me on this week's Move the World podcast. If you know of anybody that you think might make for an interesting guest, please shoot me an email at movetheworldfilms at gmail.com. Also, if you liked what you were listening to, it'd be great if you could take a minute and leave a review for the podcast and share it with your friends and your social media. Just a, a small homework assignment to help me out as I try to grow the audience. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.